join the Discovering Your Mind Facebook group and enjoy discussions, ask questions, and participate in the podcast in fun and unique ways. Aphantasia is a condition characterized by an inability to visualize mental images in one's mind. If you have just discovered that you or someone you love has aphantasia, or if you're just fascinated by the subject in general and love learning more about it, you are in the right place. The Discovering Your Mind podcast delves into all aspects of the mind's eye, including aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and everything in between. Welcome to the Discovering Your Mind podcast, brought to you by Shane'sBrainDomain.com. I am your host, Shane Williams, also known as Shane's Brain. Last week, I interviewed my cousin Sarah about how her mind works using the Discovering Your Mind protocol. This week, she's back as we discuss even more interesting concepts that she uses in her professional and personal relationships, including her childhood memories, interacting with her grandchildren, her happy place, the theater of the mind, and more. What are your earliest memories of using imagination or visualization? I, I've thought about this one a lot because I'm just very aware that I think this, I, I wasn't aware of it at the time as a child, but the more I've thought about it as I've gotten older, I'm very aware that there were um, roots in this process for me. So uh, my grandmother was a retired, my grandmother on my mother's side was a retired school teacher. We would go to her house, she would watch us occasionally, and she had a playroom. And in the playroom was a big toy box, but never do I remember there being any normal traditional type toys in that toy box. There weren't dolls. There weren't, you know, even normal blocks or anything. It was just kind of an odd collection of random, um, not very interesting things. For example, sticks, she'd put sticks in there. She put fabric that was just like on a spool of fabric, just lots of random pieces and sizes of fabric. She sewed a lot and she, because she sewed a lot, there were the spool of thread that's empty. She had a lot of wooden ones. So just instead of blocks, we had a lot of empty spools of thread and random things in there. And I remember one time asking her, you know, grandma, how come you don't have toys in the toy box? Why don't you have normal toys in the toy box? And she said, if I put a sword in the toy box, you'll never use it for anything but a sword. She said, but if I put a stick in the toy box, now it could be a magic wand, it could be a sword, it could be a, you know, stake for a tent, it could be a drawing stick, it could be, you know, so many different things. And she said, I put the fabric in there because I can't wait to see what you'll do with it, what you'll make it into. So instead of putting, if I put a dress, you'll only wear the dress. If I put a piece of fabric, it could be a cape, it could be a tent, it could be, you know, she would just list all these things. And that's how everything was in the toolbox, just imagination toys, things that we had to make them into something using our imagination. We did that so much as children. Um, something else you may know about our childhood is that we did not have TV. My dad didn't ever want us to watch TV. And so we weren't allowed to watch public TV. Later, we got movies, but just a very small, limited few of recorded movies. And so imagination play is really what we did all the time. And like I remember vividly, we we would play in what we called the willows, which was the nature area behind Grandma Grandma Hymas's house. And we would go back there and just create stories and visualize things. So one time we wanted to do because we had been reading the book Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, and we wanted to play that out. And so we found the bottom pieces of carrots and corn on the cob and cut those down and put sticks in them and turn them into pipes that we could smoke, which we were so afraid we'd get caught because we didn't want anyone to, my dad to think that we were, you know, pretending to smoke. And we would go climb up in a tree and have sticks that we'd put a string down and pretend we were fishing. And so we just had all this imagination play where we were playing out different stories and scenarios and picture the bad guy coming down on a raft, you know, all kinds of things. And, and I think because we didn't have a lot of, traditional exposure to movies and TV of all kinds, and even just traditional toys. We were incredibly poor. We didn't have a lot of those things. Imagination play is what got us through our childhood. <laughs> I think the that toy box with the sticks and fabric and stuff, I think that is brilliant. Yeah, is I agree. Cool. As far as imagination itself, the word, let's mm -hmm. talk about that. 
because okay. aphantasia literally means without imagination. Wow. And I don't like that definition for it because yeah. I have an imagination. Believe me, I have an imagination. I'm sure. It's just not a visual imagination. But when you're talking about, you know, going back behind grandma's house and imagining and playing and all those things, that's just as real to me as it is to you. I did all those things. I can do those yeah. things, right? Yeah. I'm not visualizing it, but I'm still pretending. I can still pretend. I can still come up with yeah. new and ideas. This is, you know, this stick is a wand or what I can. Yeah. You know, my, my brain still does all of that stuff. It's just not visual. So, so interesting. A, yeah. a better a better description would be an image-free imagination. Wow. Ra rather than I don't have one because I do have so one. You, it's just that, not That's a really interesting crossover there. That I mean, because the way that you would come to the determination that the stick is the wand versus a, you know, sword where I would picture a wand, like you don't have right. to picture it to know that it's going to be a long skinny stick. And that, you know, something of this size will work well for that purpose. You know, I, you right. could logically... a, that is a good point. That is a good point yeah. because yeah, this stick is a wand and now you picture it as a wand. Yeah. Where with me, this stick is a wand. It still looks like a stick, <laughs> but I'm yeah. going to pretend it's a wand. Right. Yeah, so exactly. yeah, that is an interesting make... distinction. How did you and how do you influence your kids and grandkids to be able to visualize things? Okay. So we, like I said, we do just a tremendous amount of imagination play. And one thing I've noticed is that you can teach your kids things with imagination play that they won't hear from you as their parent or their grandparent. One thing I started when my son was, my grandson was really, really young is I would tell stories about him. So once upon a time, there was a little boy named Marshall and I would teach him things like, you know, he, one day he was very hungry and all of a sudden everything just started getting very grumpy for him. He started noticing that everything everyone said made him angry, you know? And so I play out these stories because I know he's angry, but he doesn't think he is. And telling him how to handle those situations appropriately because he'll sit there and listen and he can see in his mind that I'm telling him you shouldn't be rude to people just because you're not in a good mood or you shouldn't talk back or, you know, just lots of different things or hitting someone and hurting them and not realizing that you're doing that. And so I'll tell a story where the, and then she starts to cry and her feelings are hurt and she feels like her brother doesn't love her, you know? So I'm playing out a story that he's seen in his mind to learn the moral lesson I want him to learn, you know? And so I've used visualization for teaching in that way, but to help him increase his ability to visualize things and with my children too, I've always done lots of different games with them. We, we played memory games a lot and things like that, but this is when. For this portion of the discussion, Sarah is holding up a piece of paper that she has drawn a little random looping squiggly line. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever done this or heard about this. I was going to show you. So one thing I would always do is you get a piece of paper, especially like at church or something where you need something to distract them. And I'll just write a, you know, little squiggly lines or whatever. And I'll tell them now turn it into something like you take this picture and you add to it to change it into whatever it is you see. I, I think this is called um, the Da Vinci's device. It's the same concept as looking at clouds and seeing images in the clouds or looking at, you know, the texture on a wall or wallpaper and trying to see or in tiles and things and see images in those spaces. And so oh, yeah, I like, do that all the time. Yeah. So you can visualize that this is just a squiggly line. But if you look at it the right way, you could see like maybe this is like a dragon and there's his snout and he has, you know, big sharp teeth. And then this, his tail would come up here and things like that. So you're kind of using your mind to see an image or you turn it a different way and you see something totally different. And then I would have them do the same thing. They draw a squiggly line and then I fill it in and draw something for them. And so practicing being able to see things that aren't there or visualize things that aren't there, I think just like working a muscle does increase their ability to do that. My grandson's a phenomenal uh, storyteller. He can tell, and he makes up poems and stories and songs all the time. And I think that his foundation of us, you know, seeing things in his mind really helped him with that. 
Right. So, but the interesting distinction there is maybe he's not seeing it in his mind, right? I know. You, th- I've never you think he is that. because yes. you, that's how you do it. But when you're describing all those things, I'm relating. Like I do all that. It's not visual. I, Other than that distinction, I can, I have those same experiences. I do all of that. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's such a weird thing to think about that there isn't a gap. Cause like, I, I don't know, I haven't, like I said, interacted with you a whole lot over the years, but just everything I know about you, I have your book that you wrote, one of your children's books. Was it the great Achoo or something like that? The endless Achoo. The endless Achoo. That's what it is. Yeah. And so I'm just like, it's it's hard for me to wrap my head around how you're capable of doing all of these things that you do and how you'd be doing it without the way that I do it. So right. this is something I'm going to start instead of just doing these stories with him, I'm going to start asking him to describe to me. So what do you see? What does it look like when describe it to me? I really want to know if he's seeing things in his mind or not. And to what yeah. degree? Yeah. And you mentioned a gap. Again, I don't think there is much of a gap. Like I've been able to live a productive life with this. Yeah. Right? And, and most people do. Most people don't even know about it until they're older. And then it's like, oh, other people can do that. And so it's not really a gap or a disorder. It's just a difference. That's all it is. Yeah. It's just a difference. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's just the the difference in the way that it is being done. Like what replaces what I'm doing? That's the question I have. Right. Because in my mind, I know. I know how all of these things are coming to about coming about and what I'm doing and what I'm hoping to accomplish when I'm teaching my grandkids and my kids to, you know, and so if they weren't seeing it the way that I'm seeing it, you know, what would be happening instead? How do you teach a child with aphantasia to be creative? For example, you know, what do you do? Well, nobody ever had to teach me. It was just part of who I was. And that's why some people ask me, how do you think? Because they want a replacement, right? If it's not images, what is it? And sometimes, even though it's not a good description, I will say it's nothing. Even though it's not nothing, it is something. It's just, I don't have words for it. I don't know, there's no words to describe it. Like if, you, if you're looking at something, you look at something and you know what it looks like, and then you close your eyes and you try to remember what that looked like, what happens? I can think about what it looks like, but I can't visualize what it looks like. So you remember that the apple was red, that it was yeah. unusually yeah. round, that it had one leaf, but not. Seen. Right. The com- yeah. The computer's working. The monitor's not on. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. So then you have to be able to take in, I think more information than I do. Like you have to be able to, catalog details that I take for granted and don't worry about because I can just pull up the picture again and notice it for the first time in my mind where you had to notice it when you looked at it originally or it won't be there. Yeah. And that's, that's really why I think I struggled in school because everything was just harder on that level. It's, it's like the game that you play I don't know if you did this. We did this when we were young where you get a cookie sheet and you put all the different objects on the cookie sheet and you look at it and you try to remember everything that's there and then they cover it up and you write down all the things that you can remember. Have you ever played that game? That's another but, good game that's recommended for increasing visualization. But if we did, if when I do that, I kind of take, I'm taking a mental image of it, like a picture so that when they cover it up again, I just revisit the picture. And I right. remember all the things that were there. So it's easy to remember for me to, for the most part, you know, what was on there. But if, if they cover it up and the picture in my mind goes away with it, I would have only, only way I could remember it, I think would be if I had cataloged and memorized, you know, oh, there was a toothpick, there was a safety pin, there was a, and so you're limited to remembering that based on what you cataloged the first time. If you didn't catalog it, you wouldn't remember it. So if you think about that in school, how many people are going to remember the 30 words on their spelling tests because they memorized and remembered every single one of them? If you couldn't pull it back up again and look at it again, I mean, we're, we're not computers. It's not like you could just boom, 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 30 words, all memorize the, the, the word, the letters in those words and how many there were and what order they were in. 
So yeah, I can do and that's it exactly how to, well much harder, harder. Yeah. And that's exactly how I had to do it. I, yeah. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pull anything up. That may be something that, that teachers should start doing some kind of testing for, because Jenny, my youngest sister, she has dyslexia. And I, we all know now at this point that they see things differently and it's harder for them to learn things because they aren't seeing things the same way. And so it, it makes learning harder and they have to be taught in different ways and trained to overcome those things and stuff. But children just, we always hear children learn in different ways, but why are we not exploring and focusing on those different ways? If a child has an unfair advantage and they're the top of the class and we're grading on the curve because the whole, you know, top of the class is getting to re-see the test before they take the test. And then there's this other group that didn't get to re-see the test. You know, that is an unfair advantage, you know, right. and they they aren't going to do as well. But there has to be some way that teachers can compensate for that so that those children aren't being left behind and aren't struggling when there could be a tool. So my son, and actually I, I'm going to go I'm going to go talk to him right after this because <laughs> he never liked to read books like I do. He struggled with them. He just thought that they were super boring. You know, he did struggle in class. In fact, he would do well when he was studying and he could do the work at home and his homework, he'd get a hundred percent on his homework and then he'd go take the test and fail the test. And so we started having them do audio tests with him. They would ask him to spell the word or, you know, just do things in a different way. And then he could pass the test and fly in flying colors. And I mean, I remember one time he told me he had not studied for any of the, he had not studied for any of his spelling tests, but he got a decent grade in spelling. I'm like, how did you do that? And why didn't you, you know, study for any of them? And, and he said, because I just learned phonics and just like in my, I would like, uh, sound it out. You know, he would just sound out the words in the moment and he was able to do that, but he couldn't recall having studied. So why study kind of thing? So I, I just think that he adapted to learning and what worked for him. And I think there are ways to teach children differently and help them adapt to the way that they're learning. And there should be allowances for that in school. Yeah. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is kind of for that reason, like the more people know about it, the better it's going to be for everybody in all sorts of different settings. And education is yeah. definitely one of, one of them. And yeah. I don't know, I don't have all the answers or, you know, conclusions other than just simply knowing that not everyone can visualize is going to help you when you're, when you're teaching or when you're even just interacting with people. The frustration you have with your children when they aren't doing things the way that you want them to or the way that you think that they should or yeah. you I mean, people will pin these things while well, he they're lazy or they don't care about school or, you know, like we don't or then there's the intelligence thing. Well, maybe they're not as intelligent, you know, so we start pinning all these labels on what's happening without asking the right questions or understanding that their experience may be entirely different. And what you're asking them to do is much harder for them than it is for you. And especially as parents, if you don't understand that, then you're not going to have the level of patience and understanding and support and offering the, you know, resources that are hopefully becoming available for these kind of things to help them. And I think that goes beyond just a Fantasia. I think there's so many other things yeah. that kids experience and the way that they learn and remember and retain information. I really wish our school systems were doing more to teach people the way they learn rather than this one size fits all method. It's time for you Fantasia, the part of the show that lets you chime in and share your thoughts, insights, and experiences. Today we have Heath chiming in. Today's question is how does your mind store information? I, I would probably describe it as video clips, right? They're, they're, clips and pieces um, scattered all around. It looks more like my desk, right? Where there's, there's the pile over here that needs to, this needs to be done and a pile over there and a pile over here. And I know that there's a memory here somewhere. I just don't know where that is. If you would like to participate and hear yourself featured on the podcast, go to shanesbraindomain.com and click on the You Fantasia section. Describe to me your happy place and what okay. is that to you? Okay. So 
I, I hate going to the dentist. I absolutely hate it. I was having some dental work done and there's just like a, a long list of reasons why I hate going to the dentist that I'm a germaphobe. People putting their hands in my mouth is just, it's just awful. And so they were going to have to do some work and I hate needles. There was going to be a needle involved and I'm a total wimp when it comes to pain. And so I just had this, I was building up in my mind, this like experience that was going to ruin my life. And so I was panicking, I was going to have a panic attack. And so I, I realized like, I have to calm down. I have to go someplace else in my mind. I need to go to my happy place. And so I started just trying to visualize in my mind, a place where I was calm and peaceful and at rest. And so I went back to experiences that I had with my kids all the time, Willow park, really close to where I live. There's a, a park that it's a small zoo. So there's a lot of small animals around the outside, but the inside is just a, a grassy area with big trees. And there was this one tree that was a willow tree. And we would pack a picnic with a blanket and books and go sit under this tree when my kids were little. And we would lay there together and enjoy snacks and treats and read books and cuddle with each other. And I have so many memories of that space that were just wonderful, beautiful experiences, but also the place felt magical because not only were we laying in the shade of this beautiful tree with it has a willow tree has like almost like vine like branches that hang down. And so you felt like you were kind of curtained in this beautiful fantasy place, but there's lots of, I think they're cotton trees around that would have these little white floaty things. And in my mind, I remember telling the kids they're fairies. There's little fairies floating around and you could hear the sounds of animals and it was always sunny and it was always this beautiful, restful experience. And so here I am at the dentist's office. And as I'm visualizing this space, I realized I'd completely forgot that I was at the dentist's office. I was not aware that they had pricked me with the needle and I wasn't experiencing panic. I wasn't experiencing pain. I wasn't worried about the, the OCD germaphobe in me that is like, get your hands out of my mouth. Just all of it went away. And instead here, I'm having this awful experience and my heart rate is slow. I'm feeling relaxed. Like I'm in a beautiful, happy experience. And it was then that I realized that the power of the mind over matter or the, the ability to put yourself in a different space and visualize it to the extent that it affects you physiologically was incredibly powerful. And so I started practicing that and going to my happy place and adding and changing things there. So one thing that I do when I'm flying, because I get sick when I fly, I get very, very nauseous. And so I, as soon as I get on the plane before takeoff, I just try to settle in and go to my happy place. And one thing I noticed that I can compensate for the physical physical experience that I'm having is as it begins to take off that's usually when I get quite nauseous I instead envision that I'm like riding on the back of a horse that's jolting forward and so that motion makes sense in my head and it isn't something that makes me nervous or makes me nauseous and then if, if there's any tilting or rocking on the plane then oh I'm in a hammock on a beach somewhere the wind is blowing and so because I can visualize something that makes sense to the physical experience that I'm having but it's a far more pleasant experience I don't get nauseous and I don't get sick and I don't get anxious and so creating these happy places in our minds has a lot of um, physiological benefits, but also coping with stressful and difficult and challenging situations benefits. Wow. That is so cool. Um, you know, there's all these, these little things people say, you know, I've heard that phrase before my happy place, but I never yeah. would have understood that that's what you mean by that, that yeah. detail and, uh, and how it, completely takes you out of something or puts you in a, a different place with the, with the physical. Uh, that's yeah. amazing. Well, it's, it's, it's weird for me to think that, that you couldn't do that. I'm so sorry. Right. And, and just as weird it is for you to think that I can't do it. It's just as weird for me to think that you can, you know, it's, it's yeah. such a different experience that it's hard to understand or imagine what it would be like. That is interesting. So do you feel that aphantasia has been a disadvantage to you in life? Mostly no. A loaded question. Mostly no? Um, mostly no. There are a couple things. Like when I first found out about it, I was jealous, right? Yeah. I was like, oh, man. Oh, man. That would be so cool, you know? 
But in a lot of ways, I like how I am because, you know, I'm a good designer. i a good poet. Like the things I do, I'm good at them. Would having visualization change that? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's possible. When I talk to other highly visual people, I kind of think, well, I'm glad I don't have that issue. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. Yeah. But it, because, there is a downside. There is a downside. So I think in a lot of ways, um, it helps me just kind of be the peaceful, easy, calm, easy going guy that I am. You know, there are other disadvantages. Obviously, we've talked about, you know, schooling and some of those things were harder for me, but not to the point where I haven't been able to function as a normal person in society, you know? Yeah. So, so well, and I, really I, just... I can see that. I know that you function well. That's why it was mind blowing to me that you have it. You, you have no signs. <laughs> Your own dad didn't know. Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody Again, knows. because we all use the same words and we just think mm. that they mean what they mean to us. Yeah. So, so not only did my parents didn't know, I didn't know. And most people, there's people sitting around right now with aphantasia that have no idea they have it. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. Uh, you know, I was just thinking of what some of the downsides would be of being able to visualize things the way that I do. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you can't unsee that. That's a fact. I can't right. unsee something. Yeah. So can't when unsee. I was a kid, we used to live on a farm and um, one of our job, my one of our jobs was my dad would kill the chickens and then we had to go chase the headless chickens. And pull their feathers off and put them in boiling water and get them ready to eat. Well, that's traumatizing. That's horrible as a child to do something like that. And uh, so I see those images so vividly. I see that chicken's eyes opening and closing while its head is laying on the chopping block. Like you can't unsee those things. And so when I go to eat chicken now, I cannot eat chicken that has a bone in it because I see a chicken's wing. I see a chicken's oh, thigh. Wow. I see that chicken that was slaughtered, you know, it, and I'm not even a vegan because I can eat chicken nuggets just fine because <laughs> it doesn't resemble a bird. Oh, wow. <laughs> but if I see anything in that meat that looks like the bird, I can't unsee those visions from my childhood. And so, and that's true for a lot of things. Like I, in fact, it works in reverse too. Uh, I've, I read a book by Deepak Chopra and he talks about how monks would visualize things to overcome and, and be in control of their minds. And oh. one of the things that they would visualize is they were trying to be, you know, at, abstain from sex. <laughs> and so they would visualize flesh as just corroded and filthy with maggots and just all of these things that were so just distasteful that it made the concept of touching another person distasteful. And so then they could abstain. And so he was saying how you could use that to abstain from things. And so I decided it was right when pink slime was coming out with hot dogs and hamburgers and things like that and really disgusting meat things. And I loved hot dogs. But then when I learned about them, I'm like, oh, I never want to eat those again. So I spent some time visualizing what goes into a hot dog, like how they're made and what's in there. And now I can't unsee that. I haven't had a hot dog since. Every time I think about it, I'm just like, ah, I can just picture what goes into there <laughs> and I just can't eat it. So you can use it as a tool, but it can also definitely be a downside. Read the book that inspired this podcast, A Fantasia and Beyond, available on shanesbraindomain.com and Amazon. Yeah. In fact, the more that we've been talking, the more I'm just kind of going through my mind, people I, I have in my life and, and recognizing, I bet that they don't see things the way that I do. I bet that they are seeing different versions or even less visualization than I do, because that's a problem that we run into a lot. In fact, my husband and I, our communication has just been a rough road. And one of the problems with our visualization is, or, or our conversation and communication is I expect him to be able to see what I'm describing and explaining and remember the things that I'm saying and understand them the way that I'm explaining them. And he has repeatedly said to me, he's like, I'm sorry, I just don't get it. I don't see it. It doesn't make sense to me. And so I feel like he's, he's intentionally, <laughs> intentionally choosing to play stupid. <laughs> so he doesn't have to do what I say, you know, or I'll tell him just make like, 
make it this way or do it this way. Or like I've taught him how to fold the fitted sheet so many times that we just, I'm the only one that's allowed to do it in the house because he gives up and he just, you know, wraps it up into a big ball, you know? And to me, it's like, once you've seen it, you can know how to do it. So you can do it again. And like the pillows on the couch, put the pillows back the way that I put them. And he can't remember the way that I put them. And so I'm like, you just don't care that it matters to me, but he can't see them. And so I'm going to start taking pictures and just putting them. This is how the pillows go. Put it back this way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I have a hard time remembering like, I take Ozempic for my uh, diabetes and every four weeks I have to get a new pen and you have to like do this certain thing to get it started. I have to ask my wife every single time, how do you do that again? <laughs> like, like I, I do, I do it every few weeks and yet I can never remember how to do it. Yeah. Well, and that makes perfect sense too, because he is brilliant at remembering facts and details and dates and things that are hard for me that I don't grab onto those things. I don't value them the way that he does. And I feel like somebody who doesn't have a vision, a visual rep, image to call on would need to hold on to those facts and details and numbers and dates and stuff more. And, and so how much you care about something is how much you invest into it. So if it's interesting to you, then you're more likely to remember if it's not that interesting, you don't grab onto those details. And I think that's true for both whether you visualize or not, but I was thinking about, well, you could, you know, recite all these facts and details of something that's important to you, but you can't remember how to put the pillows, like what's going on. So another thing I was curious about that you wrote down is uh, what is the theater of the mind? Okay. So that's a term that I first heard when I was working in radio. And uh, here, so here I am writing ads for radio ads, trying to, you know, get people to buy things as marketing and advertising does. And my manager at the time, who'd been doing it for many, many, many years, was trying to help me, you know, improve that. And he said, when you are writing an ad, you have to create an image in the theater of the mind. You have to not just say the words you want them to hear, but tap into the images that are already there in their mind, their memories, their experiences. And if you can tap into those things in the theater of the mind by playing out a scenario that's familiar to them, then your what you're able to accomplish in an ad is dramatically increased. For example, if you rather than just saying, you know, buy this cookie dough, it's sweet and delicious. It has chocolate chips. It's, you know, it smells great. Your kids will love it. Like those are just the facts, but he's like, if you can write a story where you say, you know, I woke up early in the morning and smelt something that was so delicious. I ran down the stairs and walked into the kitchen and mother was there stirring up a batter of my favorite cookies in, in, in theater and in marketing and advertising, we write ads to play out images in people's minds because now they aren't buying the cookie dough. They are buying the memorable experience of their childhood where mother made cookies and they felt loved. They felt nurtured. It was exciting. It like all these emotions are wrapped up in those experiences and those memories and emotions. And so by playing it out on their mind, it becomes this really powerful, useful tool in selling things. And that's how marketing and advertising works is if you start thinking about ads, they're describing sensations and um, things that you use with your senses, especially in radio versus TV. And But they do it in TV as well. They are banking on you having an association to the things that you're seeing or hearing that will motivate you to sell, uh, to buy. You know, it will motivate you to want to go have those things because you have all these associations uh, attached to the image. And so when I'm staging, for example... I am creating in the theater of a mind, a perception of what all of those things mean, like a white couch, for example, I've done this with many people. I'm like, if you picture like a really rich and famous person's home and you walk into their living room, what color is the couch? The overwhelming majority of people will say a white couch. Why is that? Why? Why is white couch so desirable? And it's because we all associate in our minds white with cleanliness and it ends up being a high end association because only people who either have the most perfectly well behaved children in the world would risk having a white couch or they're so rich that they could replace the couch whenever it gets damaged because they have so much money they don't have to worry about it and so we have all these weird associations to a white couch that 
only the most elite people would have it. Only the cleanest people have it. Only the most rich people would have it. So when I stage, the overwhelming majority of the couches I use are white couches, like the one behind me, for that reason. So people walk in and they transfer that association of the couch to the house. The house was clean. The people that lived here were clean. They were well-behaved people. So they're going to be fair in this deal. You know, they're just, they weirdly transfer all of these associations from the theater of the mind to the space or to the, the transaction and, and it becomes valuable. That is so interesting. I never, I never knew that before. I never made all those connections you just made. Yeah. It's something people don't think about. We do it without realizing it. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a mental picture is worth a million words because you have so much more coming than just what you can see. You, uh, you connect it, especially when it's happening in your own mind, you can go back, like you said, and attach it to emotions, to other sensations, to smells, to feelings, to good experiences, to relationships. Like you start adding things into the picture that could never happen in, just by looking at a photograph. You know, you just give so much more context to a mental image. And there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of research and money that goes into understanding the psychology of people in what motivates them to buy, what familiar and positive associations that people have with different colors, different words, different, you know, and so when, when people are writing commercials and radio ads and things like that, we are trying to pile in as many associations, positive associations that are associations that would motivate you to make a purchase. Like your life will be better. You'll be a better mom if you buy these things for your kids. And so that's why you can see an ad that's barely even talking about the product because we've already decided in our mind that this is what a good life looks like. This is what a good mom looks like. This is what a beautiful woman looks like. And we just associate all of those things with images that we're seeing. And so when we see them, like the list of what we got from that ad is extensive. The words they use are very, very minimally effective. The image is powerfully, powerfully effective. Well, I just want to say thank you for bringing this to my attention. I think when we first started, uh, like you first mentioned it, I'm like, I kind of, in my mind, kind of know what, what he's talking about and why it's important and all the applications in life and all of that, you know, it wasn't until I started kind of looking up the word. And then certainly through this, this interview that I just realized, like, I am missing a lot. Like I am clueless about what other people are experiencing. It's very dangerous, I think, to just make the assumption that everyone sees things the way you do or knows things the way you do or learns the way you do or remembers things the way that you do. I'm very curious to explore the world that you all live in because I feel like it will be as foreign to me as mine is to you. But, you know, like you watch these sci-fi movies and stuff and see a whole new world and everything looks different and the colors are different, and the plants are different, and everything, you know, and I just kind of think that that it's quite possible that there's this whole other world existing in everybody's minds that none of us are aware of. And if we spend the time to talk to each other and ask each other questions, you might be introduced to things you've never conceived of. Yeah. And that's my underlying message and underlying goal of all of this is to help everyone realize that you are beautifully unique and nobody else is like you. Yeah. Nobody else is visualizing the exact same way that you do. And I can, I can back that up because I have interviewed a lot of people and never once have I gotten the same answers. And like yeah. you said, it's, it's a, it's a great thing to realize, right? It helps you be patient. Mm -hmm. It helps you be understanding. It helps you be open-minded. Yeah, definitely. It's just, it really does make a difference. Yeah. Well, I think even just after this interview, I feel a tremendous amount of guilt and empathy. I feel like I need to go talk to everyone in my family and be like, what was I doing wrong this whole time? You know, well, I'm so sorry. Well, don't don't feel like guilt. That. We definitely don't want that to be a thing here. But <laughs> Well, there's a good, really strong possibility that my husband does not see things the way that I do. <laughs> I need to go yeah. apologize. And that apple graph is very useful. People should be printing that off and you take it around to everyone in your family. Tell me what you see. Tell me what you see. <laughs> what are you on the scale? Because I just need to know when I explain something to you, what are you seeing? It might help with communication and relationships. Yeah, it's a good place to start. It's obviously just kind of a, a snapshot. It doesn't explain all the details that we've gone into here today. But it's at least, a, it's a good place to start. And people actually realizing, oh, I thought everybody did it the way I did it. That's always yeah. the response. I think that's the cool part about it 
when I first discovered it, I thought, okay, I used to think we were all the same. Then I learn about it and I think, okay, there's two camps. There's those who can and those who can't, right? But now, how many people are there? That's how many categories there are. Yeah. Because, because everybody is unique in some way. Yeah. Well, and, and now that you say that, you know, I, I'm thinking you don't have to know how everybody sees, but you should definitely know how your spouse sees things, how your kids see things, because it affects so much more than just how you learn academically or what you, how you go to sleep at night, you know, the way that like, like, as I've been describing through this interview, it literally affects everything I do all day, every day. And for whatever you see, or my husband sees, that is true for them as well. The way they're doing things affects them all day long throughout the day. And if they're completely different, the more I understand about the way he's doing things, it will make so much more sense to me, the way that he communicates with me, the process that processes that he goes through to accomplish the tasks that I'd like him to do, or the things that he prioritizes in life and the things that are fine. He finds interesting to them. I'm sure all of those things are dramatically affected by hit what he sees, how he visualizes things or doesn't visualize things. And I think it can make the way that we understand each other, but also the way that we interact with each other and communicate with each other very different based on how well I know or understand him and vice versa. We should get to know our families. Yep. Yeah. Like already, I just feel like, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Like I, I, I'm thinking back on so many conflicts and issues that my husband and I have had in conversations and communication and recognizing that was probably part of the problem that was playing a role and I didn't know it, but if I had known it, I would have handled it very differently moving forward. I think I'm going to handle it very differently and have a lot more patience with him and be better at the words I use to describe things or the, the way that I communicate with him about what I'd like him to do, you know, I think it will improve our relationship. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good on you too, for recognizing that and implementing it into your life instead of dismissing it. You know, that's a, that's a good, good way to be. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. It was fantastic. Uh, you did a great job. A lot of great info there. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Talk to you later. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, follow, and engage with us. And share it with your friends and family as we continue to explore this fascinating subject. For additional information about this episode or Shane's Brain, check out the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Discovering Your Mind podcast. You are beautifully unique.